Last time, we ended at uh, about verse 13 of chapter 2. And I had made this comment, a warning especially to leaders. Your opinion can easily become someone else's doctrine out of love or loyalty. Do not insist when the Bible does not insist. Um, and you see that in many different areas of church history. Um, if I start mentioning one, I'm afraid that the floodgate will open and we, were not, we will not end the class without giving more and more examples. Um, but I will mention just uh, one, the, uh, the, the theological concept of Methodism. Um, uh, what John Wesley's idea was that there would be uh, a method to one's life of sanctification, that through certain uh, uh, really daily exercises, that's what he called his method, that, and it was prayer and Bible script, Bible reading and, and study and, and so forth. It wasn't, it wasn't a bad method, but he began to prescribe it and say, this is what you must do. And although, in, you know, maybe in the Middle Ages, they got away with that kind of stuff, with saying, this is what you must do. Um, but uh, he, what he ended up doing was he ended up burdening people who were not, I'll say, men of leisure like he was. You know, because all of a sudden you got people who are businessmen and moms and grandmothers and people who are indentured serfs working land, you know, uh, during all daylight hours and more and telling them that they had to do these things at certain times of the day. And, um, and however, Methodism lasts as a, a denomination even today with a lot of followers. However, um, I, I know this from because I know Methodist ministers and members. Um, the method is no longer followed. So it's no longer a thing and no longer a part of Methodism. But Well, let's move on. This is uh, verse 14. I hope to get to chapter 3 uh, um, in the next few minutes, but we'll see um, how we do here at the end of chapter 2, and we're under no compunction to do anything in any speed. <clears throat> But when they saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, so, or when I saw, so uh, uh, to give us the context, Paul has gone up north to Antioch, that city way, way up north. Did you hear last week, um, was it maybe Friday, that the leader of ISIS, the, 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 the mo most recent leader of ISIS, was, um, was attacked by U.S. troops in his home and blew himself up? This thing, this is not far from Antioch, okay? This is that part of the world anyway. It's in Syria, far, far to the north of Israel. Um, um, and it was in western Syria, which would be the area of Aleppo, ancient Antioch. The Orontes River is this sort of uh, S-shaped river over there on the corner of the, that upper right corner of the Mediterranean Sea. That's the area anyway. So Paul says, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, because you remember Peter was withdrawing from Gentiles when certain Jews showed up and Peter thought, oh, man, you know, it'd be easier if I didn't test the boundaries of my Christian freedom. And Paul says, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in front of them all, are you aware that Cephas and Peter are the same name? So Cephas is stone in Aramaic. Peter is stone in Greek. So that's the same, same name. Jesus had nicknamed Peter basically Rocky, you know, um, and uh, um, so uh, anyway, uh, Cephas, I should just point out, there are certain um, organisms that we call cephalopods. A cephalopod is uh, a head foot. That means it pushes itself along by using its head as a foot. That'd be like a snail or a slug. They, their, only, their only digit is their own head. 
so they kind of crawl along that way. Um, that uh, cephalopod, that's named for a different. That that's that that's that that's that's a Greek name. Cephas is Aramaic, so they're two different words. Um, although Peter propelling along propelling himself along only using his skull as if it's a foot also has a, well, never mind. Anyway, <clears throat> so I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Because Peter, by, you know, by his uh, action or inaction, had basically been telling the Gentiles, yeah, maybe you should do what these gospel-twisting Judaizers are saying that you should do. And it didn't begin with circumcision in Antioch. It really probably began with uh, 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 kosher food, things along those lines. What can you eat? What can you not eat? Um, for example, are you aware that under the dietary laws of the Old Testament, the only kind of seafood, of fish, that you can eat would be a fish that's like got scales and fins, which means that many fish, like that, that would mean that, for example, bouillabaisse could not be eaten because bouillabaisse, which is like a French fish stew, is, is, is an eel-based dish. Um, sorry if you didn't know that and I've turned you off to bouillabaisse forever and ever, but I learned that in Hogan's Heroes, which is where I learned a lot of good details. Um, um, and then, uh, well, shrimp, lobster, you know, anything like that, uh, uh, any clam-based thing or uh, what are they called, um, oysters and so all that stuff would be, would be off limits. And also octopus and squid. And I wouldn't object to those things being taken off the menu forever anyway. Catfish. I've, catfish. Yeah, I grew up eating bullhead and, uh, and stuff like that, a crawfish and things we used to catch with our bare hands in the creek and poinette. And, uh, and, and, and ask mom if they'd cook them. Get that thing out of my kitchen, you know, things like that. So no, um, they would, be, and actually frog um, would be off of, the, off of the menu too. And not to mention all of the various birds that are uh, essentially the Bible puts it down to songbirds as being the birds that you can eat. And many other birds would be off of the menu. Really not sure at all about, geese and ducks because they're not specifically mentioned but other wading birds like the ibis and the stork and things are off of the menu so there's a question did did the jews would the jews allow say duck you know pheasant yes grouse yes but certain other things no and then of course bats were which, according to the taxonomy of Moses, are birds. Because Moses only has five categories. Have we, have we done this? Moses only had five categories of animals. So the bat is one part of the flyers and so forth. So, uh, and the other one, the, the, the one that surprises people, is that the rabbit would be off the menu. You can't eat a rabbit because it doesn't have a cloven hoof. It, 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 the, I think the text says it appears to chew the cud, but it, because it, you know, but it, but it doesn't have a cloven hoof. And animals, a critter's got to have a cloven hoof. It's got to be basically a deer, a cow, sheep. Um, uh, uh, technically, um, the uh, tzitzit, tzit, the, um, the giraffe. Cloven hoof, chews the cud. But the old joke among the rabbis is you, you, you can't sacrifice a giraffe because where would you slit its throat? You know, they, they, they couldn't figure it out. So, Did you know, though, that the giraffe has the same number of neck vertebrae as a camel? Same number. They're just extremely long. Yeah, I think it's just four. So in that, in that, in that, in that long, you know, a giraffe is, what, 13 feet tall, so probably a six-foot thing, they're like 18-inch vertebrae, whereas with us, they're like, you know, inch and a, a two-inch or whatever, something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> so how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs 
We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul calls out Gentiles as sinful Gentiles, that is, um, outside of the realm of God's holy family, I suppose, in this case. He's speaking pretty strongly, but he needs to speak strongly because sometimes you have to with people to make your point. You've got to go all the way out and then come back in. You know, when I, when I worked in the restaurant business, we had a, a saying about cleaning the room, which is that you get the corners. You sweep the corners and get them clean, and the rest of the room will take care of itself. But it's a pretty good saying. I still follow that with my sons when I teach them how to wash the dishes. You get the corner of the glass clean, and the rest of the glass or pot or whatever will take care of itself. But you get that corner clean. Otherwise, what have you got? you got like a ring of dried milk or blech or whatever it is, you know, down there. So, yeah. Uh, so go to the extreme and then work your way backwards. Well, so we too, this is verse 16 still, we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Um, it can't be done. Uh, Adam couldn't do it, even though he was essentially guilty of one sin, um, which is not being a good husband. Eve couldn't do it. She was guilty of basically, in the beginning, one sin, um, which is giving in to the temptation with a single piece of fruit. You know, that's like a child taking one cookie, you know. And, uh, and, and, but it, it, that gets telescoped and transferred to all of us genetically by virtue of being their heirs and their descendants. But, Paul says, if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Paul is speaking like a, a guy who's trying to find a reasoned argument. Like the, like the, uh, G, the, like the not the Jewish, but the Greek philosophers would do. And why does Paul talk that way? Because in Galatia, they were exposed to the Greek philosophers. This is the way that, that um, Aristotle or uh, uh, Socrates, Plato, would, would have talked. That once you've gone... Once you've made one conclusion, you go the other way, make the other conclusion, the equal and opposite conclusion, or what have you. So if, if you're seeking to be justified in Christ and then find out that you're a sinner, then Christ must promote sin. And Paul says, absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. So Paul says the thing that he destroyed is the law. Rebuilding the law would make him a law breaker. But Paul says the law has been destroyed, leave it destroyed. You don't live there in the law anymore. Now you live in the gospel. The whole problem with the Judaizers is that they were trying to rebuild the law that Christ had fulfilled. It's, it's been done. Don't go back in that house. Don't go back in that room. Don't go back, really, literally, in that temple. The law is done with. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. The, the thing about the law in verse 19 is that it crushes us. I have this opinion of myself. The law tells me. You know, there, there are three uses of the law, essentially. The, the first one is the law as a curb that keeps society intact. If I'm just a crusty old man... I think in terms of student drivers and the curb keeps those stupid kids from driving up onto my lawn. You know, that's what the curb does in front of my house. The second use of the law, though, is the mirror, and that's the one that really affects me and attacks me. The law as a mirror shows me... My, my mother had a mirror that was uh, concave, I think. Is that right? Where it bends this way. And then she, and then it had little little lights on the side, and uh, it, would, it would, your face would just be huge, you know, and you could see every little flaw and detail on your face. 
Um, and I, I, I used to spend time looking at myself in that thing because it was so weird. You know, it's like the circus, you know, in, in, on my mother's dresser. Um, but uh, that's what the law does. It magnifies us and exposes every little flaw and detail that, that we have. You guys don't have nearly as many as I do, but, um, but it really exposes the, the mistakes in the, in the human face and everything like that. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So if you've been crucified, it means that you've been killed to death. That would be, that was Luther's German word, German term, killed to death. The Germans would sometimes speak that way. They'd, they'd say, well, yeah, he got killed to death. And that's what Paul says here. I, I've been crucified to death with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if, if you think I'm living and by looking at me, you can tell that I am alive, I'm not living any longer under the law. I've been killed to death by the law. I live by Christ and that's the only way that I live. And incidentally, in Christ, I live forever because the, the wages of sin is death. I no longer am affected by the consequences of my sin. Um, that doesn't mean that sin isn't in me, and he'll, he's coming to that too. But 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for as righteousness could be gained through the law, and Christ died for nothing. So this last verse of the chapter, is that right? The last verse of the chapter, um, Paul reiterates, um, if we try to be saved by works alone, we gain nothing. This is sort of the math problem, the, the, the equation of, of, of righteousness. Works by themselves gain nothing for us. Works plus Christ negate Christ. It's like multiplying something by zero. You know, it, it undoes the thing. And so that leaves nothing for us too. But Christ alone, if you get that zero out of that equation, Christ alone leaves us with everything, that's Christ. That's what I want, is Christ by himself. But if I try to add something to Christ, then I've ruined it. Um, it's a little bit like this. In the, in, uh, when I was a kid in the summertime, we would make a lot of Kool-Aid. And so you've got the pitcher of water, right? And you've got your one cup of sugar, which never seemed like it was enough. Um, and, uh, and then you've got your Kool-Aid uh, pouch, right? And how much of the Kool-Aid dust from the pouch would it take to start changing the color of the water? You know, practically none. Just a little bit of a sprinkle of that powder and it all already begins to, I'll say, what's the word? Tinge the water with the red or the purple or the orange color or whatever flavor it is that you've decided upon. Um, testimony to my childhood that we only thought of colors in terms of, or flavors in terms of color. Kool-Aid was red. It wasn't cherry. It was red, you know, and so forth. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, and that's the amount of works that change everything. It, we, we must have none of it out of there. Okay. Let's go into chapter 3, which is now the comparison of faith or the works of the law. And uh, I, I'm just going to get to the first half of verse 1 here, which is, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Um, first of all, you foolish Galatians, do you remember Jesus saying, if you call somebody Reka, you've sinned against him in the New Testament? If you call him fool, you know, you shouldn't even call your brother that much. This is in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, Paul does go so far as to say, you foolish Galatians. Why? Because he's their teacher. Um, we will allow a teacher to call us, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever name a teacher is going to call us. I don't know about you, but I grew up still in the days of the yardstick carrying teacher. Um, and who would, and I, I had a teacher who would call us, 
you know, he would he would call you a dwarfnar, or you dumb bunny, or something along those lines, uh, things that can't be said anymore and that most people would never tolerate from somebody else. But a beloved teacher or a father, you know, I've probably used the word numbskull with my children from time to time or something like that, or stupnagel, which was what my grandmother would have called me. Meathead. Meathead. Perfectly good, yeah. all in the family kind exactly. of a word. There you go. Yeah, there was a little bit more German in my in in, in in my growing up in my family, which I don't speak any of except for some of those mild cuss words like uh, Stupnagel and Dorfnar and uh, Schweinhund and things like that. Um, but Paul says, you foolish Galatians. Again, Paul is using an extreme language to let them know how serious this is. But then he says this phrase that kind of goes past us, who has bewitched you? Now, when Paul says bewitched, he really means bewitched. You guys, it's like a spell has been cast upon you, like the devil has done something inside of you. Now, when he's talking about this in his commentary, um, Luther, Luther taught through the book of Galatians at least twice in his adult lifetime in the seminary. Nor, understand how important that is. Luther was what we would call an Old Testament professor. Luther basically taught Genesis, Psalms, and Isaiah, you know, year after year after year to the seminary students at Wittenberg. That was really his role and preaching and what we would call doctrine. But Luther occasionally would step in for one semester and teach. He got to teach Romans that way, got to teach through 1 Timothy, 1 John, and 1 Peter, the firsts. He loved doing that, loved teaching them. And, and twice he taught through Galatians. It was 1519 and 15, about 36, quite late in his, in, his, in his lifetime. He died in 1546. But in 1536, he was still in his uh, early 50s, so younger than me. When he was teaching through Galatians, he went off on this word bewitched and he came up with two examples I want to share with you of people who have been bewitched. And then I'll share one from my ministry also. So um, Luther, uh, uh, of course, as a monk, had read the, the history of all of the various saints who had ever lived and he knew that quite well. And most of these were individuals who actually did live. But there are rumors about their lifetimes and things that happened to them. Well, one of them, uh, and, and, and this is a very interesting uh, 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 account because it goes back to the third century in North Africa. In North Africa, in the first three centuries after Christ, things looked pretty much not like the Sahara Desert, but more like Minnesota, South Dakota, or Nebraska. That's what North Africa looked like. It was the breadbasket of all of Europe. So that from Italy, you would sail down to Sicily and then down to Tunisia. And because it's a very short sail, that, that's where the Mediterranean Sea kind of crunches together in the middle. And you'd be there at the port, uh, ports of Tunisia and so forth. And you would pick up all kinds of grain and take them back up north because everything, the, 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 the desert hadn't encroached on, on, um, on the farmland yet. That was something that happened after the Muslim invasions in the 6th and 7th centuries, when the Muslims destroyed the cities, killed all the people, and there were, there were, there were no humans left to keep the desert out, and the, and, and the Muslims also had a tendency to salt the earth, to destroy the fields with salt. And so they brought on the Sahara, which now people are saying, maybe it doesn't have to be this far and maybe we can push it back. If they can just keep themselves from going to war for a while, there may be some progress in the Sahara with, with driving it back down to the south where it used to be. But anyway, um, uh, there was a man named St. Macarius um, over on the east side of, of North Africa, not that far from Egypt, um, actually, and um, some parents had fallen subject to, I don't know, a false teacher or a witch or who it was or a witch doctor or whatever, and who had told them 
that he had changed their daughter into a horse. And so the, the parents bring this horse and they, and they, the, to, to this um, hermit, Saint Macarius, who was living out in the desert. Um, he, 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 um, his wife had died when he was very young and his parents died shortly after his wife died and he became a hermit just to kind of explore his faith and, and so forth. But he became famous as this sort of hermit monk. And people, these, 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 these parents brought this horse out to St. Macarius and they said, can you do something, Holy Father, to restore our daughter um, and to turn her back away from being a horse? And Macarius looked at them and said, I only see a girl. Because, of course, she hadn't been turned into a horse. The witch doctor, or whoever it was, had just convinced them that she was a horse. She was still their daughter. She was still a girl. But a, a serious, um, we would call it probably a, what, a psychic suggestion or something like that. Uh, uh, anyway, that um, people can be convinced by Satan that things are not the way that they really are. And it, it goes even farther because in Luther's time, there was a man named Dr. Krause. Oh, a, a cont- I, I should tell you this. A contemporary of Martin Luther was a man Luther occasionally talks about, but then later he became famous for a different reason. His name was Dr. Faust or Faustist. And if you've heard the Faust legend, it's about a guy who ends up bewitched by the devil and entering into hell and being tormented by all kinds of things. Well, this is a guy who knew the Lutheran reformers. Um because he lived at the same time as they did. Well, a man who lived slightly earlier than that was a guy named Dr. Krause, and he was at the university, later a very famous Lutheran university called Halle, H-A-L-L-E. That's significant to us in the Wisconsin Synod because our earliest pastors came from Halle. That's where Mielhäuser, Weinmann, Rady, the guys who created the Wisconsin Synod um, in the 1850s in Milwaukee, they had come from Halle. And the, the new pastors were coming from Hala. So that, that's, that's kind of our roots. Well, <clears throat> this Krause was at Hala before the Reformation. And um, he had, had been uh, somehow twisted by false teaching, by, by essentially the, the, the devil's whispers, that although he still knew Christ, he believed that Christ was only a judge standing at the, at, the, at the right hand of the Father condemning him, Dr. Krause, and that he, Christ was only against him in every way, and there was nothing he could do about it. And Luther says, and you all know what happened to him in his, in his notes. Well, what happened to him is he committed suicide because he couldn't handle that constant judgment from Christ any longer. He took his own life. Well, that really rang a bell with me because I knew a woman, oh, miss maybe 10, 12 years ago, who had become convinced while still living that she was damned, that there's nothing that she could do to change that. Um, and um, uh, my associate and I would, would go to, to visit with her, to meet with her. Sometimes she ended up in her confusion up on the up on the fourth floor of the hospital, that's the psychiatric wing of the hospital or, or contains the psychiatric, psychiatric wing of the hospital and meet with her and that this poor woman was, con- and, it, it, and no matter what gospel you brought, no matter what comforting hymns and what psalms and, and comfort from Philippians and Ephesians and Romans and the gospels that you brought along, and you, you would think in your meditation before going to visit with her, I've, I've got it. No one can hear these words and fail to be moved and fail to be turned. Well, guess what? She had, had, was just, just almost hardened in her, not, not, not unbelief, but terror that nothing I can do can save me. It was, it was terrible because she knew Jesus and just believed that the door had been slammed shut on her. Um, terrible 
impossible to reason with her. And so that, you know, that always rings a bell with me. Oh, if you can't reason with her, stop trying because we're not saved by reason. We're saved by faith. So go and proclaim the gospel. But she would just fight against the gospel. And it was, it was, it was just awful. Um, and, uh, and her death was tragic. It was, it, that doesn't have a happy ending. It, the end, it, no more than d- the Dr. Krause in Luther's time had a happy ending. Fortunately, St. Macarius, going back to the third century, had a happy ending with his. You know, I, I don't see a horse. You know, and, uh, um, but, but bewitched, to be bewitched in modern times is still possible. We can't think that it's not possible. If it can happen in 1510... And if it can happen in 2010, what's to stop it from happening in 2022? You know, it's, um, and so we keep our eyes on Christ and keep remembering the joy of Christ. It's one of the reasons why in Hebrews we have that beautiful passage, which is a warning. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Um, just don't stop going to church. I tell the catechism kids, when... Uh, uh, when we have the Lord's Supper unit, which we just finished at St. Paul's. Uh, we happen to be at that part of the year. And that is, um, should I avoid the Lord's Supper if I'm weak in my faith? And the answer is no. That's what the Lord's Supper is for. If, if, my faith, if I feel like my faith is weak, I should run to the Lord's Supper. Um, I should knock on my pastor's door and say, I need the Lord's Supper. And if he says, I'm tired, knock again and say, no, I need the Lord's Supper. Then you can go to bed. But I need the Lord's Supper. And just, just be that, like that persistent widow in the parable. Just keep banging down the door to get the sacrament because that's when we need the sacrament is when faith is weak and when we are confused. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.